Hey everybody, so today we are going to be doing some notes here on the French and Indian War, right? And so the French and Indian War is what we're going to call it here in the colonies over in England and the rest of Europe. They're going to call it the Seven Years War, and as you can see from the dates, it lasted more than seven years. Um, but we are going to call it here in the colonies, remember we are colonists, we are British colonists, right? We are going to call it the French and Indian War because that is who we are fighting at the time. All right, here's some background. This is not stuff necessarily to write down. This is stuff to help us review where we've been as colonists, right, into this new time period. The only part on here I might write down, sorry about that, would be this part here at the very, very bottom, right, about salutary neglect, right? So what we got going on here is that we have a series of basically how are we showing um, democratic ideas, right? So we have like our um, old ideas from the Greeks of direct democracy, that's where every single person votes for every single thing. Roman republicanism. Republicanism here means representative government, so like the United States we are a republic, right? And that means that we have representatives. Back in England in, in 1215 we had the Magna Carta signed by the king that limits government, basically creates the beginnings of a parliament, right? So we got English parliament is gonna be in charge more than the king, right? Here in the colonies, Virginia, we have our House of Burgesses. That is a representative government. So this idea of republicanism is being seen there, right? The Mayflower Compact is gonna create town meetings. That's a form of direct democracy, all right? So again, we're seeing how we're seeing all these things as foundations of our new democracy we're going to have. And then those fundamental orders of Connecticut, we talked about those as a rough draft, if you will, of the Constitution, right? In between here, we got these little arrows to kind of give context to what is happening uh, during this time period. So we got this Dominion of New England, basically saying that you can't have these uh, local assemblies, local representative governments, because they were, the king wanted to have more power. Right. And then we have the Glorious Revolution happening in England. It's also called the Bloodless Revolution. That's when uh, King William and his wife Mary are going to take over England. Um, and they are now going to be the rulers. And they basically allow a lot more freedoms. They will create then, um, allow the creation of the English Bill of Rights, which will make Parliament stronger than the King. When we make our Bill of Rights later, it will be reflective of some of these same things. So a kind of a big shift, if you will. Um, and with this shift, you're going to have land ownership is going to be qualifications for voting, right? And this is going to take us away from this idea we saw in the Puritanical Society up in New England of having church membership being tied to voting. So if we go back over here, we talked before about the halfway covenant that said that you could be a church member but not have this conversion experience so you could still vote. Now there's no church requirement whatsoever anymore. It's only land ownership. So you can kind of see again this progression if we're going through time of less church involvement, more democracy, right? Less power being in the hands of the king, even though he's still a very powerful person. Right? and we're moving in this uh, opposite direction here. Right? Definitely write down this last item here, salutary neglect, right? And this is this idea of minimal intervention. So think of these words here, right? Neglect means that you are being left alone, not being taken care for. Salutary actually means beneficiary. So it's like a beneficial neglect. And this is where the colonies are left alone for this long time period. And when they are left alone, that house of Burgesses becomes very strong. The fundamental orders of Connecticut become a widely used by different places. We're also going to have those town meetings are being used and we're doing our own thing and England is not bothering us. And so we feel like we're our own independent little place until the end of 1763, right? Which is the end of the French Indian War, right? Um, some other things going on in here. The only thing from this I would write down would be the Navigation Acts, right? And the Navigation Acts are just going to be reinforcing this mercantilistic policy by England, making it where the colonies can only trade with England. They cannot trade with other colonies. They cannot trade with other countries. Um, however, they are going to be smuggling goods back and forth because people want to make money and that's just the way that we do things. Um, in this box here, you can see some of the weird parts of these uh, navigation acts. Um, so there's several navigation acts. So if you would Google navigation acts, you're going to find 
1651, 1660, 1663. We're kind of just putting them all together as like, what are they all meant to do? All right. Um, but again, they're trying to make it where you have to trade only with England. You cannot trade with anyone else, not even your neighboring colonies. Um, and they even made specifics in here against hats and wool and all sorts of things. Um, so this obviously is going to make the colonists um, angry, right? Because we want to make money and it doesn't make sense if I'm in Rhode Island that I'm not allowed to trade with Connecticut, which is literally down the road. Um, I can only trade with England. So again, reinforcing mercantilistic policy, right? Here we got our map of our colonies, all right? So original 13 colonies are here in green, right? And we want to expand, right? Um, but our neighbors here are the French. We can't expand to the east because there's the ocean. So we only can expand to the west. Well, that is French territory. So the area that we are gonna be fighting in is all of this area here on the backside of the Appalachian Mountains, right? This area between the French and English claims, all right? And so again, this is where we're fighting because we as colonists want to expand because more and more people are moving here, all right? So of all the places, all the wars, everything we'll talk about, this is the only one that has one cause and that is increased population. And that is again, because we want to move to the west. So this map here is a really good map, all right? Okay, and it shows us this idea that the French are occupying all of this middle area here. The English are occupying, again, our 13 colonies and also around Hudson Bay, right? And so this is gonna be, this area where we're fighting is gonna be this area in between. So basically kind of up here by Quebec, all right? All the way down to uh, like West Virginia, modern day West Virginia areas where we're gonna see a lot of things happening. So again, where do you go? We're gonna be in, we get to territory that is owned by someone else, right? And that's never a good idea, right? Our first clash in all of this is gonna be in that West Virginia area. Now remember, West Virginia does not exist at this point, but this is where modern day West Virginia is, right? And then uh, Southern um, Pennsylvania um, is also in here as well, all right? Ohio's over here, hence we got the Ohio River going on there. Right. So this company called the Ohio Company, they're trying to go out here to survey the land and sell it off um, to make money and everything like that because they're a company. That makes sense. Right. The person they're going to send out here to do this surveying is a guy named George Washington. Yeah, that guy, George Washington. Right. And George is going to be out here surveying and he notices all of these French forts there in blue. Right. And he then is going to start creating, we're going to start seeing our forts over here. These British forts are in red. Right. And he is going to try with some troops that he has with him to take over a French fort because he thinks that that'll be really cool. It'll get him, make him famous, um, all sorts of things like that. Um, he, his butt gets kicked and he has to leave and escape. Um, and he basically starts the French and Indian War. So yes, our first president started a war. Um, you know, good times. Right. Um, so uh, George Washington will then uh, go and escape, run away to fight another day, and he will go to a place that they will nickname Fort Necessity because um, it was built out of necessity. We will see a recreation of that in a moment. Um, and then the fort that they were attacked was called Fort Duquesne. Right. So Fort Duquesne on the map is right here. Right. And Fort Duquesne is modern day Pittsburgh. Right. Uh, the Native Americans will be helping the French. Remember, the French and Indians actually got along really well because the French treated them better than other European groups. The Delaware and Shawnee Indians are going to be the ones that we're going to see more in um, this particular war helping the French. And there's good old George when he's very young. And here's Fort Necessity. Um, you can see it is not a very uh, ample fort or anything like that. It was built out of necessity to uh, have as protection. So the name fits it well. Okay. Um, here we have the Albany Plan of the Union. It is made by Ben Franklin. So here, Ben Franklin in our picture. And this is also the same time that Ben Franklin makes this political cartoon that you've probably seen before. If you haven't, it's okay. Um, but this all goes together, right? So Albany Plan of the Union is a plan that no one actually uses. It's rejected, right? Well, if it's rejected, why do we need to know about it? Um, the idea was that it was a plan to unite all of the colonies against a common enemy. So when we have our uh, political cartoon here of the snake, um, join or die, is that idea of like, you have all of these little parts are labeled by um, of all the colonies. Um, George is the one that's missing, right? But it's the idea that we have to unite together or we will fail, okay? And so that's what this plan is all about, the idea that we should unite together against a common enemy or we will fail. 
Um, so even though we don't use this particular plan during the French Indian War, right, we will take this sentiment, this idea of uniting together against the common enemy and use it during the revolution. So it's kind of one of those ideas that we liked it, um, but not everybody liked it, and we're going to shelve it, but then we're going to borrow from it in the future. Okay. Here we're just going to make kind of a quick chart of what's going on with tactics and um, um, methods of how we're going to be fighting, right? So our colonies are going to be in green, our British are going to be in red, and remember we're on the same team at this point, however you are going to start seeing these divisions that are happening that will kind of get us closer and closer to the revolution, right? So we are going to be, and when I ever say we, I mean colonists, right? Okay, so we colonists are going to be using Indian style guerrilla tactics, right? We learn these from watching the Native Americans. Think of this as when you're in the middle of battle, if someone's shooting at you, you will hide behind a tree and then you will come out and fire and then hide again behind a tree um, because that just makes sense to protect yourself. The British are still going to be marching in formation Right, so you can see that in the images down below. Right, and this idea of watching, uh, marching in formation is considered the gentlemanly or civilized way of conducting a battle. Um, and us using this uh, Indian style tactics was actually seen as cowardly and savage. Right, so it's something where we did not get a lot of respect from the British by using these particular tactics, even though they did work. Right. Our organization is that um, we have militias, so that's basically a group of farmers who have guns, right? not a lot of experience, where the British are going to be professional military. Right? And we're going to see this also with uh, their discipline. All right? We colonists are not observing military protocols because we don't know what they are. Right? We're just farmers um, and merchants who happen to own guns to protect our land. Right? The British have drills, tough discipline. Remember, these guys that are soldiers for Britain are actually, like, that's their full career. They're a career soldier. Um, they're not just, you know, hired for this particular one time. Uh, finances, we don't want to pay for it because we are a little bitty colonists, right? We believe that the whole country of England should pay for it because they're the ones who were fighting with the French. Um, and then the British, they're coming over here across the ocean and they want to say that we should pay for it because they're defending us, they're protecting us. So both of these have actually a good idea in them, but you know, obviously that's going to cause rifts for the future. All right, um, demeanor, so like our mood of what's going on, uh, we are very casual, um, again, not professional. The British are very much divas. Their stories of some of the officers, and again, officers in the British military were usually very wealthy people, and they would stop in the middle of battle, have their servants set up a tea service and a table and everything like that, and they would stop for tea time in the middle of a battle. Um, so yeah, we don't quite get along very well. Right? Um, and in here I have several uh, abbreviations. Right? Ever uh, you have a question, message me on Remind um, if you don't know what something references. But here we have the British decide to eliminate French presence in North America. Right? So we're going to have some stuff pop up here. Right? So we have our general here, General Braddock. Um, his job was to get rid of the French out of the Ohio Valley and out of Canada, right? Pretty big job, right? Um, so he's going to be attacking the Ohio Valley, um, the Mohawk Valley, and Arcadia. Arcadia is in Canada, right? And he's attacking all these places. Obviously, you're not going to be successful in all the locations you're attacking, right? And the one that he is most uh, unsuccessful with, the biggest fail, is going to be at Fort Duquesne, and right, and that's where we want to focus because that's where we started talking about with Washington earlier. So Washington actually is going to be with General Braddock and go back to Fort Duquesne, right, and they're going to have tons and tons of troops, um, and with these troops they're bringing with them cannons. Um, and when they are trying to get to Fort Duquesne, they're going through the wilderness. So in order to bring the cannons with them, they have to chop down trees, all right, make way for these large amount of troops to come. Well, the French and the Indians, they know they're coming because they can hear them. They're being very, very noisy. So the French and Indians will actually surround the British in the woods and then have a, an attack on them. And in that attack, uh, 10 miles away from the fort is where uh, General Braddock will be killed. Um, Washington is able to escape yet again. Um, and it's a horrible, horrible defeat. But again, they're just not, they're just not being very smart about their tactics. Um, their success that they did have is that they will be able to um, get rid of some of the French 
that are going to be in parts of Canada, all right, up in Nova Scotia. And these people are called the Arcadians, right? And they are forced to relocate to the southern colonies and actually go to Louisiana. So these people now are actually what we would refer to as Cajun people, right, who are in Louisiana um, that are still there today. All right. Um, so if you have people that are from Louisiana and have been there for generations, they're actually um, probably transplants from, Can uh, from French Canada during the French and Indian War. So some success, but mostly failure. Right. Now we have finally war is declared. Right? It's totally weird. So this is the idea that you have a, all this fighting happening, but there has not been some sort of formal documentation of a war being declared between the two. So this is just kind of a side note. Native Americans are actually fighting on both sides of this war. Think of it as you want to be fighting on the side that you think is going to win, because if you are on the side that wins, hopefully they will leave you alone and allow you to um, have your land and everything else um, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the plan for all these different Native American tribes. All right. um, we're going to change some strategies with the British. All right. So we have this guy named William Pitt. So think in the future, Pittsburgh will be named after him. He's going to be the foreign minister to the colonies. All right. And so he is actually going to try to compromise and talk to the co colonies and treat us with respect. So that's a new thing. Um, and so we got colonial loyalty and military cooperation. Um, and basically the, what William Pitt promises is he says that the British would reimburse the colonies for any of their expenses. So if you guys spend all this stuff on uh, weapons, et cetera, we will pay you back. Obviously that doesn't happen, right? Um, but again, the idea that he's treating the colonies like they're allies rather than subordinates, rather than um, being told what to do. Um, so that's going to increase our morale and we're going to be more willing to fight with the British. Right? And so William Pitt will actually be who Pittsburgh is named after. Right? Um, and then here you have a picture of modern day Pittsburgh. Right? Pittsburgh is a strategic location during these colonial times because it has three rivers that are all converging right here where the city is. Right. Um, and so if you are a football fan, um, the stadium for the Pittsburgh Steelers used to be called Three River Stadium because you had three rivers that are all meeting right here. So back when we are going mostly most of our travel and economy is based on near rivers and transporting of goods, having three rivers going by is going to be very important. So that's why that city is going to be um, fought over so much during this war. Right. And remember, Pittsburgh was for Duquesne. Right. So Duquesne and Pittsburgh are the same place. Um, so we're seeing that, um, again, the French were winning here at the beginning. Now the English are going to start to win, all right? And it all comes down to a strategy of supplies. So we got this map here, lots of things going on here, but the part we want to focus on are these red arrows here at the top, all right? So with these red arrows is that the French were bringing in supplies down the St. Lawrence Seaway, down the St. Lawrence River to Quebec. Right? Well, if there's um, a way we can stop supplies from going in, all right, us, the colonists, and the British, right, then if they don't have any supplies, they can no longer fight the war. Also, Spain will now become an ally of France because nobody likes England. Right? Um, so they're going to try to help financially with that. They're not uh, really sending any troops or anything. Okay. So here's where we get to the Battle of Quebec, and um, we're also going to see that cutting off the supplies that I was mentioning from the map before. So the Battle of Quebec, all right, we have the British General Wolfe is important here. All right, we have the other general, the French general here, but we don't really need to know his name, but you might when you're reading see it. So that's why I want you to have it as a reference. Um, the British are going to blockade the French and then attack uh, Quebec. So a blockade, just to remind you guys, is a series of having boats blocking a entrance or blocking a body of water, right? So if we have this, um, the French were bringing in their supplies through the St. Lawrence River down to Quebec and then down to Montreal is by cutting that off. General Wolfe here, so the English general, he's going to um, have a blockade out this way um, past Nova Scotia so no supplies can come in and then we'll, uh, we'll sail in to then attack Quebec. So um, Quebec is, um, the Battle of Quebec is actually fairly interesting. Uh, we don't talk a ton about a lot of battles but uh, we will have little tidbits here and there. 
So here is a drawing at the bottom of where Quebec is. So Quebec is this city that then has this big cliff on one side, all right, by the river. Well, the cliff was not defended because the French were like, nobody's silly enough to climb up this steep embankment of this cliff to attack us. Well, the British are that silly. Um, and you can see in this other painting, um, people like dragging each other up the side of this cliff. And so it was somewhat of a surprise attack. And that is how um, the English will win the Battle of Quebec, right? It's attacking in an area that doesn't make sense to attack. Okay. Um, along with this, uh, we are gonna look at some paintings here and there because again, we don't have photography at the time. Um, but here is a painting of the death of General Wolfe right, at the Battle of Quebec. All right, so General Wolfe is here in the middle. All right, if you have not taken AP Art History, I definitely would recommend that as a good class to take um, because you get to see paintings like this and then see that there's more meaning in them. So in this painting, you have the um, English and their allies are over on this side, and then you have the colonists are over here on the right. Um, and the thing we wanna see here is that the colonists um, on the right, there's this black sky that's above them. That's kind of like the storm that is coming, all right? So this is the artist saying that these colonists are going to um, be creating this storm, and so it's kind of like the revolution is coming. Um, the other interesting thing here is the Native American is at eye level with the general, so um, kind of like showing some sort of uh, trying to have that dominance, uh, saying that they're equal now, um, things like that. So lots of uh, extra information that we can always see in images. Um, the war ends with the Treaty of Paris. Now, um, a lot of times I will only have you guys memorize the idea of having like a decade or a time period that is a broader time period. This is one of those times I am going to have you guys memorize a specific date. The reason for it is that a lots of treaties are signed in Paris and they named them all the Treaty of Paris. Right. So um, for the Treaty of Paris of 1763 that ends the French and Indian War, we have our maps of before and after. So you can definitely see that the French claims are pink right before the war, and then you can see they're gone out of the middle of North America. They still have some areas in Nova Scotia and down in Haiti, um, but they've basically been kicked out. And so the British now control almost everything um, in the United States territory that is going to be east of the Mississippi River. All right, so the last bits we're going to talk about are the effects on different groups of people. All right, so for the British, all right, we now have an increased size of the empire. They have a lot of debt because war is expensive. And they're seeing that these colonists are ungrateful and they are not really appreciative of what the British are doing for them. So all these things together would have the idea that we should reorganize the empire. All right, well, since we're in debt, what happens to the piggy bank? It is totally broken, all right, and someone has to pay for this war. Hmm, who could it be? Right. For our colonists, increased sense of, uh, of identity, saying that they could actually um, unite together against a common enemy, right? The, um, the French, which was the second largest um, army in the world at the time. Um, and they are starting to see that these British are kind of snobby. They don't really get along with them. They're not really seeing eye to eye, right? And it's also this end of salutary neglect. Put a big star next to that. All right, so now the British need to be involved with these colonists because somebody has to pay for this war. They're not gonna just leave them alone anymore. So all of this is that idea we need to have independence. Okay. For the Native Americans, right? remember they fought on both sides because they wanted to try to you know, have some sort of idea of autonomy after the war, have some sort of idea that you know, whoever won, they might get some sort of benefit from helping them out. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't really happen. All right, we have Pontiac's Rebellion, all right, and Pontiac is a chief in the Detroit area, so think Pontiac cars are from Detroit. It's made, named that way for a reason. Um, and with this is that Pontiac and his, uh, and the other tribes that are around him are trying to get rid of any of these settlers that were coming into their territory, all right, um, because they thought, well, we helped you during the war, um, we thought we could have our land to ourselves and you're going to leave us alone, right? Obviously that did not happen. Um, we will have Native Americans will be uh, being captured and taken to places like Fort Detroit, which is now modern day Detroit. And unfortunately you do hear of some of these stories of um, kind of biological warfare going on where they did give blankets that were infected with smallpox to Native Americans. Um, and some people say that they didn't know they were infected. Other people say they do. 
um, we're not really sure, but they knew that the Native Americans did not have any immunities to these diseases. Right. Um, our backlash on all this is that the British were like, well, okay, we got all this, this fighting happening in the Detroit area. Let's stop this fighting from happening. How do we do that? Stop colonists from going out into the wilderness. So we're going to have a proclamation line of 1763. That is this green line on this map here, right? And basically it's where the Appalachian Mountains are. And essentially it told the colonists, you cannot cross this line. Right? If you cross this line, you are going to be in Indian territory and we cannot protect you because we cannot send troops because we don't have any money. Right? So to protect yourselves, don't cross the line. What do they do? They cross it anyhow. Okay? Uh, we'll get more into that into the causes of the revolution. Right? Our last slide for today is what made the American mind unique. So this is kind of stuff from last unit bringing it into this unit of like what makes us different from the British. Yes, the British had the Enlightenment, but our Enlightenment is going to tell us that something is different, right, from Ben Franklin, that idea that we can uh, change our futures. We can go from being very poor to being extremely successful, right? We can do that. You didn't really have those opportunities like that over in England. The Great Awakening is telling us that same thing. You can control your destiny, right? And we're having representative governments where we can actually, if we don't like something, we can change it. So you can see all of these kind of flow together with the idea of change and making it where America is going to be more unique than what we saw in Great Britain. Okay? Now that you have finished this, what I'm going to have you guys do is you are going to be going to a Nearpod activity where you are going to be practicing some writing skills. Right? I'm going to be live via Remind the entire time, right? so feel free to message me and those things are going to be due um, by the end of the day today, so if you don't get to them all right away, that's okay, um, but they should not take you very long. Bye-bye. Right?